Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Great Plains Fire Science Exchange webinar. Uh, I hope you all had a good holiday weekend and uh, appreciate you easing back into the work week by uh, joining us for the webinar. I'm Sherry Lease, I'm the program leader for the Great Plains Fire Science Exchange, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. A quick note about the exchange. We are dedicated to making fire science accessible in the Great Plains region, and our focus is on grassland systems of the Great Plains. If you're not familiar with the, with the organization, we do have a media center, so our, our website, um, the address is down there on the bottom of the slide, and so I encourage you to visit it, and uh, you can also sign up for our online newsletter and other communications um, at our website. You can also access the work that we're doing through Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube pages. And uh, this webinar is being recorded. Let me get this out of the way. Um, so you'll be able to listen to it again, or if you want to share it with other folks that you think would be interested after today that couldn't join us, um, we'll have that link available through the website. A little bit about the webinar environment in case you haven't attended one before. Um, all the participants will be muted, so only myself and the speaker, uh, Robin Verbal, will be able to um, speak to you today. But you can communicate with us a couple different ways. You can write your questions and thoughts into the chat box. Um, and you can also um, give us some signals. So you might see an icon of a little person uh, with their hand raised. And uh, if you click that drop down, you should see um, some icons there to tell us to speak louder or softer, or um, you can also give us some laughter and applause and other things um, at that spot if you would like to, to interact with us during the webinar. Especially if you're having trouble hearing, that might be a, a good way to give us a signal. Let's see, and so I, I wanted to make sure that you're aware of um, some of the other upcoming events that we have going on. Uh, the Prairie Grouse Technical Council will be here in Missouri, at Nevada, Missouri, um, later this month. We have um, a webinar coming up by Alice Tipton, and she, I think I spelled mycorrhizae wrong, I'll have to fix that. Um, she's going to be talking about mycorrhizae and, and fire, specifically in glades, but she'll also um, touch on some background information of grasslands. There's going to be a fall burning field day at the Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve in Kansas. Um, and we have some more webinars. Uh, we're going to be looking at some new Ceresia research being done in Kansas. And uh, looking at the effects of juniper pollen as well. And um, uh, we also wanted you to make sure to know that there's a National Grazing Lands Conference where we will host a symposium on prescribed fire. So those are some things available um, in the coming months. So uh, let me introduce our speaker, uh, Robin Verbal. I, my little, uh, let me put this out of the way again. <laughs> um, Robin Verbal Pearson is a professor at Texas Tech University, and her research is focused on the ecology of fire adapted ecosystems and organisms. More broadly, she's interested in insect responses to fire in forests and grasslands. And uh, without further ado, I will uh, turn off my webcam and get it out of the way. And uh, Robin, go ahead. OK, Robin, I'm, I'm not hearing you right now. I'm still not hearing your audio. Now you're muted. How about now? Can you hear? All right. Go. We've had yep. some difficulty with this audio on my end. Uh, thank you guys for attending. Uh, and thanks, Sherry, and for the Great Plains Fire Science for hosting. Today we're talking fire, harvest ants, and horned lizards. 
uh, I got to Texas Tech in 2012, and this is some of the first research I've done in the Great Plains, so it's pretty exciting to me. As Sherry told you, I'm an assistant professor of fire ecology in the Department of Natural Resources here at Tech, uh, just starting my third year, so relatively new to the area. I want to go ahead and start by saying I did not do this work in a vacuum. Uh, I had four great grad students, uh, Anna Meyer, top left, Rachel Granberg, third from the left, Clara Frasconi vent on the far right, and Tabea Malinowski that did a great portion of this field work and lab analysis. And then my co-author and collaborator on this is Dr. Gad Perry. He's a professor of conservation biology here at Texas Tech. And funding was from Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Texas Army National Guard, and the Fort Worth Zoo Seeligson Conservation Fund. And we couldn't have done it without any of them either. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Uh, we'll talk about the horned lizards, the ants, and then how fire integrates into the system. Uh, and we'll discuss the links between all of these because at first glance, lizards, ants, and fire might seem pretty disjunct. Then we'll move into the specific methods we used. And then we'll uh, move on to results. And finally, some management implications. So Texas horned lizards are the Texas state reptile. They elicit a huge amount of nostalgia for local people in Texas. I've never run across an organism to date that people are so passionately excited about when you tell them that you're working on it. They love to tell you stories about how when they were young these lizards were so bountiful and they caught them and they interacted with them. Uh, so it's a great symbol for conservation and uh, conservation efforts in Texas have been on the rise for the past several years. It's a phrenizomatid lizard, uh, dorsoventrally flattened, got some nice spines, uh, pretty slow moving, and uh, recently has undergone some population level and range-wide declines for reasons that we are still fairly unclear on. Uh, pictures on the right, this is an adult, and then uh, the bottom, bottom right is a juvenile, which are hatching right now in north central Texas. So keep your eyes out if you're from the area. The ant link for this are harvester ants. Uh, we have several species of harvester ants in Texas. The, the genus Pogonomirmex, most commonly Rugosus and Barbatus for species. Local people call these red ants. And a lot of people still seek to control them in parts of Texas uh, via several uh, several techniques, most often though, uh, insecticide treatments. These guys though in arid ecosystems are hugely important as seed distributors. They are probably the single most important seed distributor in arid grasslands. And they're also a prey item for horned lizards. Horned lizards tend to specialize on these and uh, these harvester ants have very few other predators so the link between the two is significant. The pictures on this slide on the right, top right, you see individual workers from a colony, and then on the bottom right you see the nest or the mound entrance. And you can see these guys excavate large amounts of vegetation around the nest entrance and keep that maintained. So they're a real easy, conspicuous, uh, noticeable ant on the landscape. And uh, finally we've got to think about fire suppression in Central Texas. Central Texas, like much of the North American landscape, has been fire suppressed for most of the 20th century. Texas is unique, or not terribly unique for the Great Plains, I suppose, but uh, Texas also has grazing issues. So when you combine fire suppression and grazing issues, what you end up with is large amounts of shrub encroachment. So we have these once uh, savanna to woodland landscapes being turned into forests and uh, dense shrublands. We're seeing grasses being outcompeted and shaded out and general degradation of the landscape. If you're interested in this, we recently had this paper published in the Post Oaks and Prairie Journal that's discussing a lot more about uh, fire suppression, and I'd be happy to send a PDF. So the links we're talking about, on the top we see fire management, and we're interested in how fire management is affecting habitats, and conversely, how habitats are affecting fire management. So as these habitats degrade, 
and shrubs start to outcompete and outshade grasses, we'd expect to see changes in how fire affects these landscapes. Uh, less surface fires, difficulty in carrying and coverage, and possibly more intense shrub fires as fires move through. We're also interested in how landscapes and habitats affect horned lizard populations, and we're interested in how those habitats and landscapes also affect harvester ant populations, and conversely, how harvester ant populations affect the habitat. Uh, as I showed you in the previous slide, harvester ants can be impactful. They have seed distribution, they're clearing patches of dirt, so we're not exactly clear on what their impact is on the habitat. And then the last link we're interested in considering are the links between harvester ants as prey items for the horn lizard and horn lizards as predators for the harvester ants. So as I go through this work, this conceptual framework is how we built this study. And we'll come back to it near the end. <coughs> uh, we conducted these studies in Central Texas. We were fortunate to have two private ranches, the Newby Ranch and Blue Mountain Ranch, that volunteered study areas. We also worked at Camp Bowie, which is a Texas Army National Guard preserve, and the Muse Wildlife Management Area, which is owned and managed by Texas Parks and Wildlife. These sites were typical for the region. Uh, they had, as I said before, been fire suppressed for most of the 20th century but they had recent reintroductions of fire in patches. So these patches were small, 40 to 200 hectares, and they often created a mosaic of fire treatments on the landscape. This is a, a, a map of Camp Bowie, which is one of our more dramatic examples. And you can see color-coded uh, 2008 to 2014 burn patterns. Some of this fire was wildfire, particularly the 2011 fires. Uh, and we analyzed these all as fire, tested for seasonality, and didn't see a difference. So the specific methods we used. To examine lizard populations, we started with telemetry and pit tags. Lizards that were large enough for radio collars were radio collared. Smaller lizards that were able to be pit tagged were tagged. And then very small lizards were marked with Sharpie. And we monitored these lizards over the course of a two summers, one, uh, excuse me, looking at their locations once a day and followed them until the summer ended or until they were no longer able to be located, which turned out to be the case for a significant portion. To analyze vegetation, we looked at line point surveys and belt transects, and for our ant work, we did mark recapture, visual surveys, and caloric content. So for visual surveys with harvester ants, as I've said a couple times now, these nests are very conspicuous, so you can walk transects or search grids and find them relatively easily. Uh, this isn't the case for all ant species, so this is a nice benefit of working with harvester ants. The mark recapture portion looked at individual colonies and was used to estimate colony size. Uh, for this, we used a Lincoln-Peterson index, marked the ants with fingernail polish, and then returned them to their nest and recaptured 24 hours later. Then for caloric content, we used bomb calorimetry. Uh, if we think of ants as prey for harvester ants, or for, excuse me, if you think of harvester ants as prey for Texas horn lizards, then how nutritious they are is very important. So this is how we approach this, is how much does an individual ant provide in terms of food for these Texas horn lizards. So bomb calorimetry, placed the sample in the cup, and then measured the change in water temperature after we've ignited it. And that's how we uh, calculate caloric content for these guys. So we found uh, some general trends with lizards that were expected. Female lizards tended to be much heavier than male lizards. This is well documented in horned lizard literature. wasn't terribly surprising, but the same trend held at our study sites. You can see in the, uh, in the figure, this was a 
in of 31 encounters. It was our total lizard capture for the two field seasons that we worked on this project. Females were also longer than males, measured as snout vent length. Again, this is expected, documented well in Texas horn lizard literature. For our home range data, we encountered 56 lizards. However, we were only able to get eight home ranges. And that is predictable with horn lizard work. There is high seasonal mortality with these guys uh, and high seasonal disappearance rates for us. We're fairly convinced, based on our work with these telemeters, that it's not a problem with the radio collar itself, but these lizards actually are disappearing probably due to predation. We were able to locate some of our predated lizards uh, inside a coach whip and a few around birds' nests. However, a lot of them were just recorded as disappearances. So for those eight home ranges, we got four male home ranges, three female home ranges, and one sub-adult. All of these were located on the Blue Mountain Ranch and Blue Mountain Peak, which are conjoining ranch properties. Uh, we did not find lizards at the Texas Army National Guard Preserve, or uh, we were not able to sample them at the wildlife management area. So you can see in blue are the male home ranges, peach for the female, and then the one very, very small juvenile home range is located uh, just below the very elongate male home range in the bottom left of the figure. For those of you who are in Texas, you all know we've been in a significant drought and most of the wildlife work that's been done in the past five years has had a massive drought effect and trends we've seen can be attributed strongly to drought. Uh, this was not the case for our home range sizes for our lizards. If you look at this figure, or this table, showing a two-way ANOVA, looking at sex and drought and the interaction between the two and how that influences lizard home range size. You can see sex is almost marginally significant, whereas drought has absolutely no effect on home range size. So these guys aren't shrinking or, as we would expect, increasing their home range size due to drought, which is important considering the local conditions. We saw a decrease in shrub species diversity with fire, and also a decrease in shrub density. Anecdotally, we can say that this is important for patchy habitat, but it's also exactly what we'd expect. Uh, as fires move through and we increase fire frequency, the density of shrubs decreases, which is good for this habitat, since the shrubs have been too dense historically. And additionally, the shrub species richness is also being decreased by fire. So again, good for the habitat, good for the management objectives that they're locally trying to, trying to achieve. With our harvester ant work, we found no difference in harvester ant colony size by burn near or burn treatment. You can see in the figure, uh, years, year burned is on the x-axis, and the average number of workers per colony is on the right. For at least the last five to six years of burning, there's no distinguishable difference. On average, there were about 5,500 ants per colony, regardless of fire treatment. We also saw well, no difference in ant colony density between burned and unburned areas or among burned years, though I'm not presenting those data here. Uh, this was surprising. We thought ant colonies would probably increase in burned areas just as a result of increased seed availability. However, that wasn't the case. However, we did see some cool differences in calorie content, just not the differences we would have expected. Ants from burned areas tended to have an average of about 25 calories per ant, whereas ants that were collected in unburned areas 
tended to have about 27 calories per ant. This is calories with a little c, not with a, not with a big c. Uh, 25 and 27 on a human perspective doesn't seem like a big deal, but you could also say that they were 10% more, that there were 10% more calories in ants from unburned areas. And if you're a lizard and you're eating 30 or 40 of these a day, that difference in calories could, in the long term, make a significant difference for you and your survival. So we're continuing to look at this trend. We're unclear exactly on what might be causing it, and we're very, very open to ideas and speculation. But it was, it was a nice surprise. So after we looked at vegetation, uh, ants, and lizards, we had three pieces of the puzzle, but we wanted to put this into a larger context and see what the interactions were, what was actually driving all these trends. Uh, so we used survival modeling and program MARC with AICCs. Inputs for this were vegetation parameters that we measured, shrubs. We also included uh, leaf litter and uh, grasses and herbaceous, as well as cover, snout vent length, so lizard size, and then our harvest ramp studies. We looked at this initially with both sexes together, but then decided to model each sex separately because male and female lizards have really different, different behaviors during their active season. So we're hoping to see from these exactly what's driving these survival trends. And what we saw was that, in general, male survival tended to be a lot higher than female survival. Male survival for Texas horn lizards depended solely on how big you were. The snout vent length was driving the entire, entire model. However, for female Texas horn lizards, survival depended on low shrub density and low leaf litter density. And from experience with management and experience in the system, the way to achieve lower shrub density and lower leaf litter density is through fire. So female survival is very heavily dependent on the use and reintroduction of fire in these systems. So if we come back to this conceptual framework, looking at lizards, uh, ants, habitat, and fire, What we see are these links between fire and habitat being really important, and conversely, the link between habitat and lizards being really important. What we still don't know and weren't able to examine in this study are the links between harvest ants and habitat, and between habitat degradation and how that shapes fire behavior. So there's a lot more work to be done, particularly on habitat and fire as we go forward. So the take-home message for this study is that we can't assume that management actions impact all individuals of a species in the same way. Males, in this, in this case, males and females had vastly different needs in terms of their habitat. Males, it was all about how big you could get. Females tended to need more specific habitat variables, decreased leaf litter and decreased shrub density being the two. It's also important to know that fire effects on wildlife tend to be indirect. So we weren't able to examine direct lizard mortality in this study, but I'm confident to assume that fire is affecting habitat, which is affecting lizards. And then finally, the ants gave us a really mixed message. We saw ant cal calorie content being much higher in unburned areas, but it turned out that that didn't matter when it came to horn lizard survival. So with that, I'm going to stop, and hopefully you guys have some questions, and I would be very, very happy to answer them. I tend to talk a little fast, so we're probably done a bit early.
Robin. Um, if you have questions, please uh, type them in the chat box and we'll start working through them. Yeah, Robin, that, do you have any ideas of uh, or plans to start testing some of those conflicting messages you're getting with the ants? Yes, uh, as soon as somebody funds it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're really interested to look at, especially with the calorie work, to look at exactly what variables are starting to cause that. We know that seeds are more abundant in our barned areas, so food sources shouldn't be the issue. Are food sources further away? Are they exerting more energy to forage to more food sources? Uh, yeah, we're really excited to start looking at some of that. And did you look at any relationships with grazing? How was the, the grazing management differing in any of the properties that you were studying? We actually managed to find properties that had no grazing in our study sites, so we didn't integrate that for this study. But future studies would be great to, uh, great to start looking at that. I see Carol Rogers is asking okay. about the general range area that harvest ants roam. Ah, it's a good question, Carol. On average, 20 meters from from their nest their nest entrance. There's been some studies that have found them as far as 100 meters from nest entrances. Ah, it it's really variable between studies and also between species. All right, uh, Stan. So, speed. Robin, we have. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sherry. No, I was just gonna just make sure that you saw there were some more questions coming in. <laughs> I was just reading through them. Uh, so, Stan, Stan's asking about the role of fire ants in the system. Uh, Stan, it's a great question. I was conflicted on whether to include those data or not. We actually looked at that. Uh, turns out, fire ants have no difference in colony abundance among burn years. Uh, there's also no difference in colony size among burn years. We didn't get to the, ca the calorimetry work with fire ants, uh, and we didn't get time to measure specific interactions between harvester ants and fire ants in those areas, which is one of our hypotheses about harvester ants. And um, there's a general thought that harvester ants are declining, though uh, we, didn't, we didn't see that in our study. So fire ants could be playing several roles. One, they could be uh, impacting egg and juveniles for the Texas horn lizards. They could be interacting with harvest ants negatively, or they could be playing some other role that we're not clear on. Uh, so great question. Chris is asking about uh, differences between ant colony size and general ant size between burned and unburned areas. So ant colony size, we did not see a difference. Uh, we did mark recapture methods for ant colony size, and there was absolutely no difference between burned years or between burned and unburned in general. Ant size is a fantastic question. Uh, with harvester ants, it's a little easier because most harvester ant species are monomorphic in size, so you don't see those uh, soldiers and uh, minor workers or major media minor like you do in some areas or in some species. But other studies have found differences in ant size between burned and unburned areas, specifically among species, so that smaller ants tend to be in areas that were burned and larger ants tend to be in unburned areas. And you also see that with ant colony size too. Uh, smaller ant colonies tend to be in burned areas. There's a great study from Canada with uh, John Acorn and James Glacier looking at that exact question. Uh, Jean Foltz asks about... Jean, can you clarify, uh, den, is that density? Oh, ant nest. I, I think I've got it now. Yes, okay. Let me flip back to that slide. I 
I believe I've gone too far. Is this a, this is a slide we're talking about, I think. Ah, so, yeah, ah, ant colony size can be very, very variable. Ah, generally, colony size can relate to colony age, uh, with smaller colonies obviously being the newer, younger colonies. So that's where you see a lot of this variability. Uh, on, the, on the upper end, we generally think of colony size being an indicator of colony health. So on the lower end of variability, it's an indicator of age. On the higher end of variability, it's an indicator of health. You're very welcome, Jean. Other questions? I want to thank everyone for attending, and uh, again, we will we'll post the link. Um, looks like Stan has a probably a question. Oh, it's a we have a thanks. Okay, so um, Robin, do you want to type your uh, email address into the chat box there in case somebody thinks of something later that they would really like to talk with you about? Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and put a blog, lab blog, and in case anybody does the Twitter thing, I'm going to put that on there too. Plug my own stuff. <laughs> Please feel free to contact me with additional questions if you have uh, observations as well. I'm more always very interested in those. I think Stan might have a question. Yeah, Stan uh, says he lives south of Dallas, used to have a lot of harvester ants and horned lizards, now none. I hear that from so many people, Stan, uh, that the decline is just striking. Historic literature from the early 1900s said up to 1,000 uh, thousand individual lizards in a 40-acre block. It's just some really dense numbers, and you know, now, now we struggle to find 30 or 40 to finish up a study. If I had to speculate, I would say the harvester ants and horned lizards are the decline of both is linked to land management and lack of, probably lack of fire on the landscape. Uh, we're seeing shrub encroachment and that's, that's causing a lot of problems for these guys. Great. Thanks, Robin. Um, I really appreciate you taking time to put this webinar together, and um, I know that many more people